Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Confession of that personal sin puts you back into spirituality. It's not an issue of your salvation. It's an issue of your spirituality. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins or if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And that restores us to spirituality, which is important for Bible study. John 14, 26, when the Holy Spirit teaches you, he's able to recall it. And that's really important in your life. Be able to carry the word of God out of here in your soul that can work for you. And so, our Father, we thank you for these that have come our way today by automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister, Father, the lesson today. Consider your calling, brethren. I pray, Father, we would understand the importance of it within the context of the superiority of the wisdom of God over the foolish wisdom of the world. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we... Thank you for coming out in a rainy day, and I didn't see any boats, so your car made it. That's good. Uh, Paul opens with an interesting statement. <clears throat> we're at the end of chapter 1 in Corinthians. Uh, we're not at the exact end, but we're at 26, and 26 is going to take us to the end of the chapter. And he says... I'm interested in the idea for consider your calling, brethren, in that passage. Let's take a look at that, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 for a moment. I didn't write it on your paper as I normally do. I'm in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. And uh, he's opened up a final, uh, a final lesson on the, the superiority of the wisdom of God over the wisdom of the world in verse 26 through 31. In verse 26, he, he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh and not many mighty, not many noble, semicolon, but God has chosen the foolish things. And he goes on to a discussion that's going to end in 31. And when it ends in 31, he's going to tell you, now you've got something to boast about. You have nothing to boast about when you're under the, the foolish system of the wisdom of the world. There's nothing to boast about. I mean, it's all shame and, and desecration. But he says, when you connect your life to the wisdom of God, then there's a lot to boast about. And, and that's the truth. And that's the truth. So I want to I want to focus on this idea uh, today about he opens this final section of study with the idea for consider your calling, brethren. Can, and, and what's he talking about? Say, he's talking to believers about a calling into Christ to the Christian life, which gives us access to the omniscient thinking of God. Isn't that? I mean. It's one thing that we say, well, you know, Jesus said in John 14, 6, no man can come to the Father except through me. This passage says, yeah, when you come to the Father, you're able to tap into the omnis omniscience of God. When you study the Bible, you're studying the omniscience of God. That's, I mean, when you stop to think about it, it's just an awesome idea. Uh, well, anyhow... One of the things that's of interest to me as a student of the languages is the word for. I, I know in, in, in the English, this word is all over the place. And you always, I mean, it's, it, it could be gar, it could be un, it could be a lot of different ways. And even the word for and gar, which it is here, the word gar can be used different ways. This use of gar, the word for, is an inferential conjunction. Now, that's really important when you come to a conclusion because we, we know when we get to verse 26, it, it, um, 
probably if you have a study Bible, they're going to show you that 26 through 31 is a section. They may not have headed it. They may have bold printed it like verse 26, maybe in bold print or, or an asterisk of some sort next to it uh, to tell you that he's in a final, he's in a final discussion on this subject, the foolishness of the world, wisdom of the world versus the superiority of the wisdom of God, the omniscience of God. This inferential conjunction. Now, the reason I bring that to your attention, why it's so important, is that an inferential conjunction in the, in the, as well as in the English, you have them in the English. If you want to know what an infer, inferential conjunction is, you can look it up in your dictionary, in your English dictionary. But what it does of great importance to us in Bible study uh, under hermeneutics, we're required to look at these things. It draws a conclusion from the facts or premises previously stated. And everything, everything he's talked about in chapter 1 about the superiority of the wisdom of God over the foolishness of the wisdom of the world is now going to be drawn to a conclusion in chapter 1. He's going to come back to this subject matter in chapter 2 and look at it a different way, the wisdom of God. But he is about to close it up to show you the superiority of the wisdom of God. And so what an inferential conjunction does in the Greek language, it refers you back to what Paul previously taught in chapter 1 and especially what just preceded us, verses 18 through 25. And what was that? Well, it was the premise of the superiority of the wisdom of God over the, over the wisdom of the world. Agreed? And, and we looked at that in good... So he's drawn a conclusion now. He's going to give you some final ideas that he has about that. Then he's going to move on to, in chapter 2 to another, another look at the superiority of the wisdom of God in the practical part of our life. This is kind of like theology in chapter 1, like the theology of it. My job is to take the theology of it hermeneutically correct, make sure that we understand what the writer was correctly saying, and then try to, try, to, try to bring it into some kind of application in your life. And sometimes that's the most difficult part. So I'm going to look at four aspects of the idea when he says, consider your calling brethren, talking to the royal family of God. All right? One of the things, one of the things that's of interest to me, point number one, is the word consider. Consider. If you were a Greek student and you knew something about the Greek language vocabulary, you would be surprised that he used blippo here. Because blippo is the typical word to see with the eye. And he's talking about like I, I saw you. Not in a dream, not in a vision. I saw, I actually saw you. This is a kind of uh, sight you would want in, at the place of an accident. Did you see what just happened? Did you see that person run into that other person? Did you see it? That would be blippo. I'm not asking you, did you imagine it? Did you think it up? Is it part of your mind operation? No, eye to mind, not mind to eye. Mind to eye is faith. Eye to mind, it could be empiricism, it could be rationalism, it could be a lot of things. It, or it could be, it could be the very facts of doctrine that you have learned. Blippo is a really interesting way that Paul's doing this, and I'm going to talk about Blippo in a little different avenue with you because of Paul's use of it. The other thing that he did that was interesting to me, he put it in the imperative mood. This is it, this is a present active imperative, second person plural, y'all. Now. In the Greek language, this could just as well be a present active indicative, okay? Because you have the liberty to do that by the way the Greek is formed in the indicative or imperative. If, if you, and some people make this an, an indicative. If you, made, if you made this an indicative, I'm speaking to people who might have done that. They go like, I, can, I have the privilege, I can do that. 
And they do. You can make this either way. Then it, it, if it is an indicative, they're required to identify it as an empiric, empiricetical or an, um, an imperative use of an indicative. Okay? So either way, you're going to get the same idea, a very strong idea. I see this as a command. I, don't, I see it as an, imper, an imperative, a command. But like I said, for those who might want to translate this in indicative, you must, be, uh, you must honor the Greek language and you must study. The indicative can be used many different ways. Contextually, it, it would be used as an imperative use of an indicative. I'm just telling you, because I've, I've probably got somebody on the internet uh, that is interested in languages that way. So I make that comment to you. Blipple, I used it as a present active imperative, second person plural, and it means to see or to consider as a command to the Corinthians by Paul. He's now summarizing. He said, look, you got to buy in. I'm, you got to buy into the wisdom of God. You got to buy into that in your life. The wisdom of God is superior to any knowledge you could get from the world. When you gathered all of the knowledge you have of the world under the wisdom of the world, it would, listen, all of it together would not lead you to God. That, we, we studied that in 1 Corinthians one twenty one. If you gathered all of the great genius wisdom of man and all of his great thinking, the wise men, where is the scribe and the wise men? All that. Remember Paul said that? If you put them all together and gathered all their wisdom, none of it, nada, would lead you to know God. And yet, that's the first introduction of the word of God to the, when the church reaches out to the world. That's the first line of information is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of Christ that brings you to a relationship with God. And that relationship with God allows you to tap into the genius of God in your personal life. What a phenomenal idea. And the world with all of their great wisdom and filling up the world with library books of goofiness. As far as the relationship with God, their foolishness, right? The foolish wisdom of the world cannot lead you to God. Doesn't mean that the books don't have some sense in them, but they're not designed nor is their wisdom designed, even if they declare it, to bring you. And listen, a whole organization, Paul fought a whole organization called Gnosticism that came out of the word gnosis, which is the word knowledge, which Paul is talking about. It's just, well, anyhow, he used the word blippo. Blippo means to see or to look with observation. Go look at the birds. Go look at the flowers. Good common sense will make you a good observer of life, won't it? But that's what common sense is all about, an observer of life. Common sense about things, right? I grew up as a common sense kid. The culture I lived in was all about common sense. My grandfather would say it 100 times a day, common sense. Son, common sense would tell you don't do that. Common sense. Just think it out. Th observe it. Look it out. If you're paying attention. Blippo means to see or to look with observation, eye to mind contact for information. Eye to mind for information. As a believer, you have, here's what Paul is saying. As a believer, you have looked around you and you have observed two systems of wisdom in the world. And you will discover if you observe them, they're in opposition. They're in opposition to one another. For example, darkness is the wisdom of the world and light is the wisdom of God. Just to give you an example, you can observe darkness and light. If you look at the wisdom of the world and their, their regard for God, it will all be darkness. If you go to the wisdom of God, it will all be light or enlightenment. The devil uses all these words against us, you know that, don't you? 
only the only the wise person in the word of God knows when the devil's blowing smoke. Observation. Jesus used parables to teach observation. He used parables to teach observational truth. Observational truth. Observational truth will lead you to the truth of God's word. That was his pattern of parables. So when he comes to Luke 15, he talks about the prodigal, prodigal son. We've all got, been with prodigal children. And there's not a family alive that don't have some prodigal, uh, prodigal people in it. Agreed? What, my I guess, okay, my family is the only one. <laughs> all right? Now I'll acknowledge it, and I was one of that family. All right? The prodigal. Now, when he writes this as about, he does three par he does three parts of one parable, doesn't he? You know, the coins, the sheep, and then, and then the sons. And he's establishing a principle about salvation in it. Well, when we get to this, we meet this prodigal son. Verses 11 through 17 are the key verses. And you observe him. He started out, he had everything. He was on top of the world. And when it winds up, he's on the bottom of it. How did that thing get flipped over on him? He was on top of the world when he left home, and he was on the bottom of the world when he came to his senses. The world had flipped him upside down, and he had the good sense of observation to realize, how did I become a pig? How did I become a pig? And the world was trying to keep, teach him that it was normal for him to be a pig. And he went, no, that's not normal. I'm a human being. Just because I live with the pigs don't mean I'm a pig. And if I lived with, if I married one, we still wouldn't be. Right? I am not a pig. But he, listen, it was through observation that he came to his senses. And he went, this life is not what was intended for me. And, and it is not. This type of product, prodigal lifestyle is of the world. It's not of God. And he came to a sense and he said, I'm sick of being sick and tired. Right? And he went home to the father which treated him like a sane, normal human being. Because he came from a good family that treated him justly and righteously. And so the prodigal son would be one of those great parables. I love it when you read about this, when this opens up on the prodigal son. Listen to me now. And I, used to, I used to use this prodigal story every time I went to rehab centers. There's a guy I talked. This guy I came and said, I want you to meet a guy today. Started up here and got flipped over on his backside and couldn't get up. Listen, if you're on your backside and you can't get up, you still can look up, can't you? That's the story of the prodigal son. You can still look up. And when you look up, there's hope. And when there's hope, there's a way to get to your knees and then get to your feet and walk out of your mess. The story of the prodigal son, you know how it opens? It says, and he went on a journey. He went on a journey to hell and life. It says, he went, and he went on a journey. What a journey. That, that was a journey to hell in life. Well, it's well worth. And what happened to him was observation. I ask you to consider this morning. Stop and think, not right now, because I need your attention. But later, later this week, go back and take a look at this. Don't throw it. Whatever you do with that piece of paper, don't, don't let me find it thrown away. Take it home and throw it away. Burn it. Do what you want. But don't do it here, okay? Don't do it here. Well, thank you. Take Williams. Take Williams. Later, he can, he can wall, wallpaper his house with it. Listen, here's what I want you, I want you to consider. Do you realize, now I know you do, but do you do it often enough to be encouraged by it? Do you realize what you've been saved from? 
You know, I hear people say, well, I was always a good kid. I was raised in a Christian home. And I just became a Christian just to become a Christian. I mean, I, I don't care. Do you know what you were saved from? I don't care if you lived in a good life and was treated just wonderfully. And I mean, that wouldn't we all like to have had a home like that? You know, where people weren't hollering at each other and dragging them out and swearing at them and saying, if you go outside, I'll kill you and all that kind of stuff. But do you realize what you've been saved from? Do you understand you've been saved from Adam's sin? I don't care. It has nothing to do with how you were raised. It's how you were born. It was how you were born. You were born a sinner. How about that? You weren't born a saint. You were born again to be a saint. We're all, we're all illegitimate children. Do you know that, don't you, by birth? King James calls us bastards. I like the King James because I used to be called that. <laughs> and I went, well, that's a biblical term. <laughs> so I didn't know I was in the Bible. Do you realize what you've been saved from? And do you realize what you've been saved to? I mean, ha have you the ability to observe your life and see that? How has the gospel of grace salvation changed your life choices? Oh, no, no, no. Not how it's changed your life. No, 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 no. How has it changed your life's choices? I hear everybody give that glowing testimony. I got saved. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I'm, I'm glad for that. How has that changed your life's choices? Now that's where the, where the rubber hits the pavement. Do you understand the darkness you lived in before Christ? Even as a kid who went to church and was in a good home and they taught you all the Bible stories and you sang all the Do Lord's songs. Listen, you were saved out of darkness. Do you have any idea what that was? Do you know what it meant? To be saved out of darkness. Everybody was saved out of darkness. And at some point in your Christian life, you got to know what that darkness is. Oh, it's a guy who was drunk down the street. Huh, you were in darkness. Oh, it's the adulterer. Um, you were in darkness. Do you know what that darkness was? At some point, you've got to come to recognize that. You've got to consider that. You once were in that darkness. Next time you pick, point your finger out and go like, well, he's a sinner for sure because he does such and such. That's darkness. Do you understand the darkness and quit pointing your finger outside? <clears throat> People do it because they don't understand the darkness that they, they were saved from. And the light of Christ after your salvation, not the light of salvation, the gospel, the light af after salvation. We're called children of the light. Walk as children. Walk as children of the light. What does that mean, you say? Well, that's why you come to Bible study. And over a course of time, we will teach you that because we're teachers of the light. And when you learn the light, then you learn what darkness is. Without the light, you don't know what darkness is. When you're born in darkness, darkness is light. When you come to Christ, you go like, boo, that's light? Yep. It is. Listen to Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes spiritually that's the eyes of their soul to open their eyes that's the eyes of their soul not that not their physical eye their their spiritual eye to open their eyes see that's what happened to adam and eve there it, it comes a reverse back to you it comes in reverse back to you when you come to christ open their eyes i see oh i was lost and now i see I was blind and now I see. I was lost and now I'm found. To open their eyes so that, watch this now, 
so that, one, they may turn from darkness to light. Listen, God opens your eyes to show you here's darkness and here is light. Now you've got to make choices. Walk in the light, not in darkness. So that their eyes were open, so that they may turn from darkness to light, Tur may turn, that's volitional, and from the domain of Satan to God, second that, here's the second that, the second that, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ Jesus. What a powerful idea. Got my eyes open. Got my eyes open. That's 23. I got my eyes open. I went, whoa. Whoa. And I had the privilege of having my eyes open to make eye-opening decisions to walk as ch a child of light. And when I didn't and made a bad decision, I confessed it and got back into the light. I stepped out of darkness into light. The blood of Christ works on both ends, salvation and spirituality, 1 John 1, 9. Here's point number two. Consider your calling, brethren. You were physically born under the foolishness of the wisdom of the world. Al talks about this all the time. I mean, he just can't get away from the subject. Right? I mean, he's done this ever since I've known him. I've known him too many years, probably. <laughs> I've known him forever. And he cannot get away from that because of the awesomeness of the journey for the, for the Christian. He is overwhelmed by this for the Christian church. He sees it as a great, a, a great gap in their life. As Paul did. Paul wrote about it a lot. Consider, he, he learned a great lesson in it uh, uh, when, he, when he got disciplined the Lord by, by not obeying him on specific things. Remember that? Agabus come and said, don't go to Jerusalem. Give that money to somebody else and have them take it, Paul. Do not do that. He went, I'm a big boy. I, I wear my bit britches high. I can do this. I'm a big boy. I got big boy britches. I mean, you ain't got big enough britches for God. I don't care how, how big you think they are. They're never big enough for God. I don't think they were wearing Do I? <laughs> what? I don't think they were wearing breeches. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they were wearing back then. But anyhow, I'm talking like a farmer, ain't I? I'm talking like a farmer. Well, anyhow, listen, you were born outside the wisdom of God system. You were naturally born outside the wisdom of God's system, and as such, you did not know God. 1 Corinthians 1.21. The people went on, observed creation in the true sense of the word, with positive volition towards God, discovered God. They didn't get in the classroom in the wisdom of the world. You know, Paul wrote about that in Romans 1.18. You did not know under the wisdom of the world, you did not know of the intimate relationship that God desires with you. That was, that's was that been the most, probably other than God sent his son to die on a cross for my sins, the most important second piece of information that I got that stuck in my soul is that God desired a relationship with me in that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance for a relationship with him. And he cares so much about it that at the point of salvation, Romans 8, 15, 8, 15 through 17, the Holy Spirit witnesses your spirit that God is your daddy father. I mean, how enormous is that? And I don't know about you, but I don't know how important it is in a child's mind when he says daddy. But I can tell you from a daddy standpoint, when you hear daddy, that's dynamite. When that little child, and I'll tell you another one, when that little child says granddaddy or whatever he's going to call you as a, as a second parent is dynamite. It's dynamite. I don't care what they call me. 
You know, they used to, what do you want, what do you want our child to call me? Well, he'll decide that, won't he? No matter what you tell him, he decides what he's going to call you. They, uh, all the kids, they couldn't say Rick. My son-in-law, they couldn't say his name, so they said Ick. <laughs> they couldn't say Rick. None of them could. They said Ick, but they loved this guy. I mean, he would just come in and sit down, and they'd just climb all over him like he was a, the old mama dog or daddy dog. You know, they'd climb all over him. And Rick was kind of not that guy, not that, I mean, he likes him, but he doesn't go out of his way to go like, hi, how you doing? He just comes in, sits down, smiles, and they climb all over him, kind of like a dog knows. You know, if a dog knows you're avoiding them, at least that's the way I've had it with him. And uh, they called him Ick, and so guess what? Everybody, I mean, they, I mean, 35 year old kids, hey, Ick. <laughs> I mean, you get stuck with names there forever, and everybody, they, they, oh, Mammy, all the kids, they couldn't say Nanny or whatever, so they called Jane Mammy. Oh. And we all call her Mammy. She's Mammy. She's 80 years old, and she's Mammy. Everybody walks into Mammy, they write letters to her in cards, and they send it to Mammy. And I think, you know, I think, Mammy, how I love you. Yeah, see, when they call her Mammy, I want to break out in a song. I said, well, that Southern tradition, they got her. I, I don't know where all that comes from, but I'll tell you an interesting, you all know John 3.16, don't you? What, you? what you ought to pay attention to is the 21 verses. And they're broke down in two sections. And if you have a study, if you have a, one of those red letter Bibles, you'll, you'll, you'll see the second half is all red letters. <laughs> when you read, you see, what you do is you forget who was written to and who he's, who he's talking to. See, he talks to Nicodemus personally in the first part of chapter 3. And he talks to the Pharisees and all those others in the second half of that. You ought to go back and read it. It's really interesting. See who he began talking to, who he then verted off to talk with, and then he, who, who he really gets after. It's really interesting. Well, anyhow. But I'm thankful that you know John 3.16. But the next time, go back and read it all read it all it's really interesting and it's all about a, a child a father a father son relationship I give my son to you and the son says I give it so that you can have a relationship with my father isn't that marvelous oh yeah you ought to read John 17 if you don't think that's there read John 17 for since in the wisdom of the world through, the, through its wisdom did not come to know God. See, there's your 1 Corinthians one twenty one. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached, i.e. the gospel, in verse 18 called the word of the cross, to save those who believe. Look at that. To save those who what? Believe. Non-meritorious thinking called faith. In a... Uh, Romans 8, 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading, that should be leading, not letting, leading to fear again. Isn't that interesting? See, that catches my attention. Fear again? Where did the first fear, first fear come from? Wisdom of the world. But you have received the spirit of adoption of sons by which you cry out, Abba, Father. See, you should never fear. Never fear again. For once you believe the gospel of Christ, you're placed into Christ. You can never be placed anywhere else. Christ, Christ is in the hands of God and you're in the hands of Christ. Therefore, you're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God. No one, no one, no one, no one can remove you from that relationship. Not even yourself once you believe. Not even yourself. How about that? Because at the moment you believe the gospel, you receive something 
you have not received, you see, but here is what you have received. You ought to read that closely along with Galatians 4. Every church age believer, I call it cab, every church age believer is rescued. I, I tell you this all the time until you begin to teach other. You say to me, Ron, why do you keep repeating it? Why do you, you, you draw these two circles up here. What are you trying to do? Then you put the, right? Then you put the gospel in the middle, right? Between those two, you got those two circles? This, is the, this one is the wisdom of the world, and this is the wisdom of God. This is run by Satan, and this is run by God, right? Christ is the whole deal. Colossians 1.13 says that the moment you believe the gospel, you are rescued from there, and you are transferred to there. Romans 1.13, uh, uh, Colossians 1.13. And why do I keep doing this? I want you to get it. You can do this on a napkin, and you can do it so quickly, it's, you're amazed how quick you can present the gospel, where you are and where you should be, and how you can get there. You don't take a, an hour to teach that. I just taught it. I do this all the time on a napkin in the, in the office. And like, eh, 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 floating around in some kind of, Disney World goofiness called the wisdom of the world. And I go, like, look, here's the issue. Boom, boom, boom. I put it on a napkin. I show it to him. Here's where you were born, perishing, unsaved. Here, through the gospel, now you're saved. Here, you were unsaved. What do I have to do? Well, you got to believe 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that the gospel is Christ died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. The moment... The moment I consider it, the moment I believe it, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. When I believe it, then I have the assurance of God's promise of Ephesians 2.8.9, I'm saved by grace through faith and I myself as a gift of God. I'm placed into Christ forever. I'm in the union of Christ. That's new covenant, church age, and there it is. It's not complicated. Not complicated. And I keep telling you this, and at some point, you're going to buy into that, and that's how you share the gospel of Christ to people. That's how you share it. They got to know what they're being saved from, how they're going to be saved, and what they're saved to. That little packet of 50 things will do the work. That's what I believe. And so you have like passages like John 1, 12. To as many as believe, receive. You believe you receive. What? Become sons of God. To as many as received Christ, God gave them the right. Everybody's talking about right. I'm so sick of this stuff. I have a right to this, and I have a right to that. You don't have these rights. But you have a right to become a child of God. But it's not on your effort. It's not... The government didn't do it. The wisdom of the world can do it. Christ is the only one that can do it. There's no other way. There is no other way. Religion's always trying to tell you there's another way. Always another way. There is no other way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. It's my Father, and he can, you can't get there apart from me. But in me, you can become a child of God like me. I'm a son of God. You're a son of God. Think about that. I get his inheritance. Think about that. I'm connected with his inheritance. I'm connected with everything about him. I'm a priest. He's a priest. I'm a priest because he is a priest. This is church age, people. Point four. Oh, I like this one in 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of, that should be of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, what kind of mercy? Great. How much? Great. great. How much? Great. great. I mean great mercy. Listen, it took a lot of great mercy to save a wretch like me. That's what Paul said, didn't he? Paul was so appreciative of God's mercy. How did you how did you be how did you get out of the muck and mire of sin that you were in, Paul? God's great mercy acquitted me. 
Think of that. Acquitted. Never to be charged again. God's great mercy. Did you deserve? No. You didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. That's why it's mercy. He says, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again, has caused us. His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, a confident expectation about life. Ain't that the truth? A confident expectation. I meet so many Christians who are bummed out. That's just a term I have. Bummed out. Now, I can't put my finger on any one problem. They just... They, ha they have no hope. They have no confident expectation about their life. You know why? They don't study the Bible. Gee whiz. They, they go to churches that just clap and holler and have a good time, and I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I go to ball games. I like rock and roll. I don't think it's going to get me to heaven, but it gets a good night. It's a good evening out. I love rock and roll. I like good old rock and roll. It takes me back to places in my youth that I, I really enjoyed. Of course, I had to be saved from it, but <laughs> still enjoyed it. Listen, born again, here's what you're missing. Not hope. Well, what kind of hope? What kind of hope? A living hope. A confident expectation about one's life. So important. What are you going to do when you can't do no more? What are you going to do when you, you can't drive your car any place? When you can't get out of bed and do anything. What you going to do? Is that, is, are you going to say that life sucks? What are you going to do with that life? Where is your confident expectation about living? It's in Christ, dear people. It's not in this world. If you're looking for this world, you're missing the boat. It's already gone. You're missing the boat. What are you going to do? Do you have enough doctrine to adjust to that life? You should. Undesover, undeserved suffering is a magnificent place to be when God chooses it for your life. And you know, as a pastor, I've seen undeserved, I've talked to undeserved, talked to people, coached them in undeserved suffering at all ages. I've done it at ages of five and ten, teens, young married, middle aged, senior people. I've, I've, I've been a life coach, so to speak, on the word of God about suffering. A living hope. It's not based on the way the world sees it. It's based on the way God sees it. It's about the wisdom of God. And listen, if you can't find contentment when everything's going good and you're unhappy with your life because you've got some kind of expectation that the world develops and not what God does, listen, if you're miserable then, listen, you've got to get out of that system. You're in the wrong system. You're into worldly, worldly wisdom. You got to get out of it. How are you going to get out of it? With the word of God. You gotta, you've got to switch over to the word of God. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but listen, I've got somebody on the internet from somewhere in the world, which is amazing to me. Somewhere in the world. Some places, some places that I can't find on a world globe. 
I thought the only place there was podunk was Michigan. <laughs> but I find out there's podunk everywhere in the world. John Dyer says, we just got somebody from someplace. I can't find out a map anywhere. How interesting is that? You know, the map didn't pick it. It was so small, the map just, or maybe wasn't existent. Who knows? The wisdom of the world thinks the world, listen, I want to compare, I want to, and I got to close. The, I, let us consider physical death by comparing it by the wisdom of the world system and the wisdom of God says, just take physical death. Right? Just take physical, I mean, We're all going to funerals, right? All going to funerals. Listen to this. The wisdom of the world thinks that all of your happiness is attached to the good times with good people and good activities of life during your time on earth. Birth to death. That's it. That's all there is to life. We say all those are temporal. And listen, you should read the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, 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 vanity. All life is vanity. <laughs> if that's your lifestyle, that's your book. That is your book. That's your Magna Carta to freedom. And all it is is bondage. Listen to this one, Luke 12, 19 and 20. I say to my soul, that's in our dialogue, isn't it? I talk about inner dialogue, and you, act, you, you look at me like, inner dialogue? What are you talking about, inner dialogue? It's when I say to my soul, when I say to myself. And so here, listen, I say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years to come. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See, life is all about what you eat, sleep, drink, and be merry about. But God said to him, oh, God's a party pooper, ain't he? What a party pooper. You fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. What's that mean? You're going to die. The green ripper, reaper. Well, it might be a ripper. I don't know. This very night, your soul is required of you, and now, who will own what you have built up for yourself? You ought to ask yourself that question before you die and sign your will, because if there's a bunch of people in your life you don't want to have one penny, you wouldn't give one penny, I wouldn't give them a penny, well, you might as well go ahead and put it in your will, because if you're not going to give it to them while they're living, why would you want to give it to them when they're dying? Would you believe they're going to squander it all away? I don't know. It's your money. You do with what you want to. I'm just talking. This very night, you're, but this, because I'm talking because it's in the text. Who will own what you have prepared? Who's, who's going to take over your bank account? And listen, this is a quote from two different passages, Isaiah 22, 13, Isaiah 56, 12. Is there life after death? Is there life after well, the wisdom of the world says no, and if they do, it's so co co completed. You know what I mean? <laughs> that you can't understand it. Like a Hinduism, re re reincarnation. Wouldn't that be interesting? I'd probably come back as a flower. Anyhow, I put passages down for you to read. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 32. He said, if from human motive, worldly thinking, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does a prophet me? if the dead are not raised. Well, what would it profit me if I go out and put my life in danger for whatever cause? I 
and don't believe that there's a life after death, what does it profit me? I mean, what's it profit you? Might profit somebody else. Might profit somebody else, but what's it going to profit you? Profit, profit, it profit you nothing, he said. Nothing. It will profit you nothing. And then he says, if the dead are not raised, then it leaves you with this. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And that's it. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is in vain. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now I say this, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. Don't get caught up in that foolishness of the thinking of the world. The Bible has living hope. Let us pray. Our Father, we're thankful today for these who have come with us by automobile and the internet to set for one hour. I thank you, Father, for all the people that have contributed to sharing fellowship, allowing a lunching where people can break from their jobs, get a bite to eat, get refreshed by the word of God, and go back into their living hope of life. I pray, Father, today that we would take this message uh, understand it, consider your calling. I hope we would consider our calling, brethren. We represent the wisdom of God's side, not the other side. May we be good students of the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen.